Father, we thank you for um, what you're going to do tonight. We thank you for your word and the fact that you've um, you've written it down for us, and uh, we're going to try and get our heads around it tonight. Uh, help us with that, Lord, because we're um, um, we don't always get it first time. So um, I hope we can um, put across um, what's going on with this in Romans tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. So we started Romans a while ago, and um, basically Paul introduces himself first couple of chapters. And then he rips straight into humanity in chapter 1. And he starts ripping into them. And this is what's going on. Everybody is basically in this category of um, rebellion against God. Treacherous against God. And God is revealing his wrath towards mankind. And the basic thought about that was that as God reveals his wrath towards mankind. Is that it is like a people go down this uh, downward spiral of um bad behaviour and all that kind of thing, only to find its level in the society that you live in that gives you laws where you, the only reason why you're not going around being totally depraved is because people say you'll go to prison if you do it, right? All that kind of thing. But basically everyone's in a, in a bit of a position with God. Um, he rips into the Jews because at, at the time of writing, Paul is writing to the Gentiles in, in Rome, but there were also Jews there. And the Jews were a little bit like we get in a lot of churches today. They were a little bit proud of the position. They were like, oh, we're God's chosen. And all you people over there are pretty much like the lesser beings because you're still sinning and all that. Forgetting completely is that no one's righteous before God. And Christians sin as well. So he's like, you know, he's saying that to them and, and Jews are sinning. So they have the law and they're, they're really proud saying, oh, we were the chosen ones. We've been given the law. And we've got all these outward signs of God's kind of like chosen election, chosenness, not even a word, election, right? But that's nothing, because Paul's saying it's what was going on on the inside. Are you actually breaking God's law? And the answer is yes, they were. We move over to chapter 3, and then it starts getting really good because it talks about no one's righteous. It's just the condition of mankind that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And um, we, we get down to 3.20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. For us, that's good works. So in other words, you can't do good and get yourself into heaven. You can't observe written code or legal kind of requirement and get yourself into heaven. But here it is. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. 21. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law or good works or trying to earn it, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So right away, Paul's there, the cat's out of the bag. How do you get this righteousness with God? And the answer is to simply believe. All right? And, um, and then the, answer, the question must be, believe what? You know, what are we supposed to believe? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to initially get into the engine room of, of salvation. What has actually happened? Right, take the religion out of it. Right, we don't want the, um, choirs of angels singing about it. We don't want people in frocks telling us and wagging the finger to get us into a church somewhere. What we want to do is find out what actually happened at salvation. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. So Paul's let the cat out of the bag. It's through faith in Jesus Christ uh, to all who believe. That's uh, verse 22. Then he goes down to talk about um, chapter 4. He's basically saying it's, 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 it's reasonable to say that that's what happens. Belief gets you God's righteousness. Because I, right from the very beginning, the first person ever chosen, Abraham, believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, And then David believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. The mechanism of it has never changed. Mm. Okay, But the vehicle by which the faith come, comes has changed. And now, yeah, go on. Question. Um, so believing in Jesus and um, get, gets you righteousness. When you say righteousness, you mean you're right with God? Or yeah. This is exactly what we're going to talk about tonight or over the coming weeks. But just to answer your question is that provision has been made uh, by uh, when Jesus died on a cross. Uh, this was God's plan. We, we mentioned that he was presented as the mercy seat. Okay, And we're not going to go through that teaching again. You can listen to that. But all when we hear about the blood and all the torture that he went through and all that kind of thing, he became the sacrificial lamb that was symbolic in the Old Testament to speak of what was the real thing to come. So people in the Old Testament were never actually really forgiven. You, they, they couldn't get to heaven because heaven was shut. 
until Jesus dies on the cross, heaven's closed. You can't get in there because the, the sin problem in man has not been solved. Okay, so um, crummy sin can't get into perfect heaven. It's like an operating system. You don't want a virus in there, and it's a little bit like that. And I tell this story about a wave pool, you know, one of these uh, leisure centres in Britain years ago, <laughs> right? And I'm, I'm in this wave pool, and it's beautiful, it's like warm, and that's really rare in Britain. And I'm in there, and I'm swimming around this thing, and I loved it because it's beautiful, clear water, and they put these plastic palm trees, and that in them days, that was good for me. I see them all over the place here now, but like, so it's great swimming around, and suddenly I see this brown thing bobbing away in the pool. Right, so I'm swimming, and I'm going, all right, swim, and it starts to come towards me. And then the wave pool started. Okay, so the wave pool starts, and this brown thing, now I'm trying to get away from this brown thing that's coming towards me at some speed, like, I'm swimming away like that, so, not a great swimmer. I'm not a great swimmer, alright, but I can take a wave pool anyway, almost, <laughs> nearly drowned in bears water, but there you go, so I'm trying to get away from this thing, and, it, and I'm thinking there's a poo in the pool, right, that's what I'm thinking, alright, and to put it in nice terms, I got trouble for telling this story once in the church, they got all funny with me, but I'm sure we can handle that, there are other words I could say, and I'm thinking it's, a, and I'm thinking it's like, it's following me. I'm, like, I'm trying to get away from this thing and the waves are all over the place. <laughs> anyway, um, I got out like, and, and it's like, when I got out and I felt like there'd been a poo in the pool, I couldn't get in there. The, the pristine cleanliness of it had gone and it felt like whenever I go in that water now I'm going to think about this <laughs> con contamination that was in this pool and not only that, it tried chasing me out. I'm like, what's going on here? It had, it had a mind of its own, but it's a little bit like that. So, God... Yeah. Mm -hmm. you don't like that this is it. So the so the perfection and the, 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 the beauty and pristineness of it is gone. And here's the thing, right? God doesn't want pui sin in perfect heaven. So the thing is there's a there's a wall of separation, right, which which sort of like you've got God is holiness, righteousness, purity and power. All right? And then you've got mankind which is fractured right down, you know, in several ways, because we've got the sin problem going on. Now, when Jesus comes along, he solves all that. And one of the ways he's we can when I talk about the way he solves it and actually look into the um, engine room of salvation by seeing what actually happens. Thanks. And, um, unless it says Jesus, don't answer it. Right, so. <laughs> so I'm joking. Joke. Might be an emergency. All right. So, um, yeah, he doesn't want poo in imperfect heaven. So what has to happen is that we, who are sinners, mm -hmm. we've got to get somehow fixed before we can even have fellowship with God and all. I'm going to talk about all these things, what's actually gone wrong. So, when we look at chapter 5, which we've been on this uh, couple of weeks now, I'm just going to read a few things. Um, and Paul's kind of let the cat out of the bag and tells you how you can access this faith. Because Paul's a little bit like me. I want to, I want to get you to believe. And the mechanics and the engine doesn't matter, even though we do need to discuss it for a different reason. All right. So basically, my car, I've just spent a couple of grand on putting a new clutch in because I don't know how to drive a car. Is that basically what happened? No, or, that's not or, <laughs> an old clutch. Maybe I'm being a, a bit too harsh on myself, but um, whenever $2,000 leaves me, I get this panic of going, it must be something to do with me, you know. Cause I, but, um, but anyway, I'm driving the car, and tonight I'm driving the car, and it feels a lot better now it's been fixed, obviously. But I'm thinking, I wouldn't even know where to start with a clutch. And what we're going to talk about when we discuss the, the component parts of salvation is it kind of matters that you learn this and it's fun to learn it because if you are a believer it firms up some of the stuff that's in your life. And when we say put on the full armour of God to protect you, you'll be able to readily get those instruments and put them on and realise exactly what's happened. But also it gives you a, a hint of how powerful and loving God is to have, have chased you down with those components and said I'm going to... I'm going to ingratiate you with these things, you know. So, and, and then this is the thing. So, starting in uh, chapter five, verse one, if you not turn to it. Therefore, since we since we have been justified, so that means put on, put on it. You, you, you're not guilty through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, we've already done that bit. We read, we've done that, uh, I think it was last time we did this. And then we're going to go on to, chat, uh, on to verse 12, 5, 12. And I just want to just want to read it through, um, and then we'll just highlight some points. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, I'm going to emphasize that, through one man, and death reigned through sin, 
and in this way death came to all men because all sinned for before the law was given sin was in the world but sin is not taken into account where there is no law so in other words you can't be told that you're wrong about something if there's no standard to tell you that you're wrong yet um, nevertheless death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses because Moses gave the law he's just saying there was no law then but yet people still died and therefore sin was then um, that nevertheless death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam who was the pattern of the one to come now this is loaded because what's, what's happening now is saying that, that Adam is the patriarch and God lumps you all into that category and we're going to show you how fair that is by the time we get to the end Okay. 15 but the gift is not like the trespass for if many died by the trespass of one man how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man Jesus Christ overflow to the many again the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification for if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man many will, become right, many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Right. Now, that sounds complicated for one reason. It is. Right. So it is complicated and it's a little bit difficult to get your head around. But um, what is generally coming through here is let's just look at um, let's just look at um, 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men. Right now, go to uh, 15. Uh, but if the gift is not like the trespass, for if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came through the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? And then 17. For if by the trespass of one man, right, so you get in this repeated phrase, the trespass, the sin of one man. Mm -hmm. Now let's just turn. I think I've got a thing in 1 Corinthians 15. Just keep your finger in Romans, right? So, where is it? 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and I think it's 22. One Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So here's the picture that we've got here. This, to understand this, we've got to look at it this way. If you, if you picture one man and call it Adam, hashtag one, okay, Adam one, what you've got is that everybody who's born from the lineage of the first Adam dies, okay? And you've inherited all the things that he represents. And God, all, all mankind is brought under that one head, okay? Now, it's not unreasonable... Because one of the things what happened through that inheritance is that we inherit all the things that went wrong for Adam. Okay? And that's the sinful nature. But here's the thing. And this is what, if you're taking notes, this can be called the problem. The problem with mankind. And the problem with mankind has four separate elements to it. The first one is everybody, like Adam, you've, we've just read it, dies but they have a dead spirit. You're born with a dead spirit that can't communicate to God. You're born with a dead spirit that you can't communicate to God. Secondly, you're born into the slave market of sin. Because what's happened is when the occurrence happened in the garden where they ate the fruit, is that was disobedience and a direct um, divergence from God's direct command. Do not eat of the fruit. They ate of the fruit. Could you the first part of the second point the first part of the second point you're born into the slave market of sin yep 
the slave market of sin. So the first one is you, you're born with a dead spirit that can't communicate with God. God is spirit. If you've got a dead spirit, you ain't going to be talking to him anytime soon. All right? So you can't even appeal about this. So it's problematic. Um, this, then you, you, you're born into the slave market of sin, which means that you can't help but break God's law. Okay? You can't help but break his law. So... This one guy goes around saying, have you ever told a lie? And everyone's like, yeah. well, you're a liar then. It's like, what? He says, well, you've told a lie, you're a liar. What? Yeah. Have you ever um, looked lustfully at a, a, a member of the opposite sex? Well, yeah. Well, you're adultery then. What? It's like, you know, it kind of, because that's the standard of God from Jesus onwards. That's the standard of God. We are at heart level. God knows our hearts and he knows that we are, you know, we go off track and we, we do the things that um, he's expressly told us not to. And um, that's not great because when we sin... Okay, that incurs a punishment, and we've all got a, we've all got like a sense of justice, um, where the person down the road who you know badly beats up some person should get punishment, and we go, oh, throw them away, throw the key away. Have you ever heard, have you ever done that? Someone's done something, and we go, oh, that's wrong. They should go away for five years, and we become the judge. You know what I mean? But it's because we've got a sense of justice. Now God's exactly the same, but when we break His law, okay, He has to judge sin and punish sin and it's right for him to do that so he righteously righteousness and justice go hand in hand he's right to punish sin we have a problem we can't talk to him and figure it out we keep sinning and then we've got like wrath that's owed to us and punishment that's owed to us and then the, the last one and it's not in no particular order because of all this stuff this this sin and um, the wrath of God is on us and we've got a dead spirit then we are unrighteous and we can't have fellowship with God even if we could have any kind of thing to do with him we can't be in his presence because it's perfect righteousness and perfect holiness we can't we have to have a righteousness of our own to be able to have fellowship with the almighty okay so we've got four problems and if you want a little bit of a way of remembering that you, you can't stop sinning you can't stop sinning you can't survive his presence, you can't stand in his presence, and you can't speak to him. So there's three S's. You can't stop, you can't survive, you can't stand, and you can't speak. And if you've got a relationship on earth where you have got another person and you can't stop getting on, you know, breaking their law, and you can't survive in the presence because they're going to kind of punish you because you've violated their standard. And you can't even stand before them because they won't let you in the presence unless you fulfil certain criteria. And you can't even speak to them. Then you've got absolutely no way of getting a relationship with this person. It's absolutely ended. There's no chance. Do you get it? One offsets the other. Once you get one, try to push that way. The other one pulls you down. You know, oh, I've not sinned today. And then suddenly you will sin. And it's like all oh, the old thing. Wrath is owed to us. And, um, and that's something that happens. So if you, if we talk, I talked about the first Adam as being a person, Adam hashtag one, well that's Adam, the original Adam, okay, and everything that comes from him, all the generations that come from him, we are all ancestors of Adam, are all in this situation, in this situation, when we're born into this earth, okay, now before you start like shuffling in your seat and thinking what am I going to do about that, because you should be, if that's the case, if there's an almighty God who we're accountable to, and we can't even get off the mark to talk to him, then we've got a very, very serious problem because wrath is coming on the earth. Okay, that's what we're told in the Bible. Okay, um, we're in the slave market of sin. Um, there's rightful wrath coming upon us, and our unrighteousness. We, we couldn't even fellowship with him anyway. We've got to sort out the fact that we're not on, not right with him, and we've got a dead spirit. So what we're we going to do? Anyway, we're going to spend this week and next week talking about what actually happened to be able to solve all them four problems all in the work, finished work of Jesus right? and as I said we, we're going into the engine room of salvation but first just to start all this off is that you've got Adam hashtag one and we're all descendants of that so you can't get out of that you can't suddenly say oh right well um, I don't think I, I want that to be my life because God says well that's it no one's righteous not even one you come after him and you might think well that's a bit unfair because I didn't really ask for this you know, this doctrine of inclusion in this first Adam, what am I going to do? I didn't really ask for that. I didn't sign up for this. I'm just born into this world. But then it all turns round on us because you've willfully sinned against God. And you've done it consciously. Oh, everyone has. Okay? And you've broken that thing. Now, you might just want to throw it all out and just say, oh, you don't even believe in God. 
you know that's an easy thing then you'll find something else to believe in like Darwinism or Hawkingism or Dawkinsism is that a word? I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but everyone's trying to find these high priests who will speak a different gospel the good news is that we all came from apes to some people because then I've got no accountability for sin I can do what I want within the law of the land and we'll just compromise with the law of the land now and again you know so my life's fine because I can do what I want well that's not what your heart says because everyone secretly knows that when you do break God's law there's a there's a little en- conscience conscience engine going jing, 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 in the background and no matter how, what kind of things you do to sort of stop that it's always there you know, and it's and it just ding, 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 ding. after a while it might go away, but then you'll sin again, and it's ding, 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 this conscience engine. So there's a moral code somehow within us. Moral code, I'd say everyone's got that. You can see that moral code. You can be so evil and so non-caring, but then you're just going down this real dangerous downward spiral. When the lights are switched on, you won't even know it's light. You know what I mean? Because you were there, and someone said, and we've said it before in this group, the darkest darkness is when you don't even know it's dark. You, know, you don't even perceive the danger, you know. So. Where does this moral code come from again? Well, I mean, the the, the Bible tells us that everybody who's born into this world, you get like a sense of right and wrong. I, when I went to school, and I did, honest, and um, you know, the, I didn't go in a class. I didn't go like maths, English, science, history. Don't murder people, you know. Stop jumping in bed with your neighbour. On it. you just didn't get a class on that because people. The, the idea is that you didn't need to really be told that. That would come out through society or all that kind of thing, and um, you know all this kind of coveting. Or you know you get the moral commandments, the Ten Commandments, and all that kind of thing, um, which give us a moral compass about what we're supposed to do. Uh, now a Christian lives by the Spirit. And we are, the, the Spirit of God lives in a believer and, and guides and shows and all that kind of thing and almost brings into life that moral code that's, that's written on us and we can get very sensitive to what's right and wrong. So, But yeah, there's, there's like a, some say a moral code, I think it was Descartes which said, um, you know, that's proof of God, that you've got an inward sen- sense of right and wrong and you didn't have to kind of go to class for it. You know, it's just there. Uh, yeah, it's just there. So, I mean, that's a someone could go off for an hour's argument about well, is it valid and did you not pick it up by nurture or is it nature and you know you can go off and do all that stuff. But as a Bible believing Christian, I believe what the Bible says and said it's written on our hearts. When that's not the thing that pumps blood, it's the core of our being. Okay, that's where it's written. So, four things, four things that are gonna stop us and trip us up every time to get to God and to be right with God. So the big deal is that um, God has solved this problem, and He solved this problem through Jesus. All right. Now let's think about Adam hashtag two, because the Bible tells that that Jesus is Adam hashtag two. He's the he's the last Adam. So the first Adam failed. He sinned um, and 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 got it wrong um, in following God's codes and all that kind of thing so what kicked into uh, action was the salvation plan the rescue plan for mankind um, and that goes through the bible he has to choose a man and he, then the man is becomes the heralding of, of, of his, his offspring become the nation of israel the messiah is born through the nation of israel and um, he comes to give his life for the sin of the world and um, and dies and resurrects and comes alive and same thing as resurrects ascends goes into heaven and is glorified so now in our time what believers christians believe that jesus is alive now and he's glorified and when we think of heaven we think oh dead people go to heaven but wait jesus is alive in heaven so it's like hmm? what did you just say jesus is alive in heaven there's a man alive in heaven and that's the whole point of christianity because now you give your heart to him you believe and that becomes an entity that really starts to work in your life and all that kind of thing. But Adam too is Jesus. Now when Jesus came, he fulfilled, he didn't sin. And um, he he fulfilled all the commands of God. He did everything on our behalf. So when you got the law, and this law that we're talking about, this, this rule book, Jesus came and fulfilled all of it perfectly. All right? So when you say I'm a follower of Jesus, you're saying openly, I know I can't fulfill that law. I know I'm going to trip up over it every time. Because I've just watched my life for the last 15 seconds, and I've sinned about 15 times in that 15. You know, you know what I mean? I've, I'm not walking this out and doing it well, but I know a man who can, and he's Jesus. So therefore, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus. Now, here's the thing: what happens? 
is that just as you're all categorized in Adam hashtag one, okay, as a sinner, doomed, wrath is on you, and all that kind of thing, when you believe, you are placed into hashtag, uh, Adam hashtag two, okay, and the same principle applies. That, that uh, in, and this is what this is what this passage is trying to say. Is it something to? Uh, you're probably getting onto this plane of it that Jesus is obviously Adam hashtag two. Never came from Adam oh yeah, I mean it's yeah, that's biologically. Yeah, so so it's good that you reminded me of that because what happened is everyone's born and we've noticed these four things that are wrong. Well, if any of one of them things was wrong, just one of them, okay, then you can't. You, you you're just going to trip up all the time. One of them doesn't get you in. You know what I mean? So somebody had to be born that didn't have this category, not born from the first Adam. And this is what the virgin birth is all around. Everyone goes, oh, virgin birth. Well, God can do anything. He stood on his earth. If he can produce an earth, and, a, and the Bible says he flings stars into space and speaks galaxies into existence, then I'm sure he can make a virgin of a baby. You know what I mean? You know, I, I'm not going to do diagrams or anything, but, you know, God can do anything. You know, the untraditional yeah, way. The whole, the whole reason why um, the virgin had, had Jesus was so that he was sinless, wasn't it? Yeah, he, sin, sin he didn't have a sinful yeah. nature. All these things did not apply to Jesus. Because yeah. sinful nature passes down through, through, through the, the first Adam. Yeah. So if the seed goes into the woman, not through, because the, the man passes on the sinful nature. Probably yeah. should have mentioned that. Okay. So if by a traditional coming together of a man and a woman to produce a child, the man's passed on the material to be able to produce a child that's not escaping all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But if God places the material in Mary to be able to produce a child, then it's not through the first Adam. Yeah. It's through God himself. That's why he's called the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. It was literally his son. Mm -hmm. He was born. So so she um, she gives birth to a baby that hasn't got a sinful nature and all this kind of stuff. And obviously he becomes, um, you know, the, he starts his work on earth to rescue us all and give us great teachings and everything like that. All coming to a point where um, there is a little bit of an incident where he goes into the desert and he's tempted by Satan and it just so happens there's three temptations just like the garden there was three temptations um, Mark tells us that there was wild animals there was wild animals there in the garden he named them all um, and there's all these similarities between the first way that Adam hashtag one sinned but the way the second Adam did not sin he resisted every single temptation and that qualified him to be placed on a throne no, hang on a cross. <laughs> so it's like, do you know what I mean? It qualified him to say he, he, he succeeded where, you know, everyone says the cross was the victory and it's true. But there were victories along the way where the, the scenario played out that it was led into the desert by the Holy Spirit. And these, these, the, the Satan himself tempted him like, like in the first, and he succeeded where Adam, hashtag one, failed. So therefore he was, he was bound for the cross. And um, the, um, the, the, the horror of it all, I guess, is that the innocent and the righteous and the one who's not in the slave market and he's not sinned and um, judgment isn't upon him because of that. He's um, he's righteous completely to the core and he, he hasn't got a dead spirit. He can communicate with God and that's why he did all the miracles and all that kind of thing. All that that person decided that he was going to take the full wrath and the full punishment on behalf of every single person who will ever live, who will ever live, believer or unbeliever, now wait, he's done it for everybody. So, so what Jesus has done is he's bought back every single soul from the um, clutches of Satan, the clutches of sin and death, and um, everybody who's ever been born, for all intents and purposes, in the New Testament period and Old Testament period, well, let's just deal with our time. Everybody who's on earth now has been purchased from sin and death by Jesus. But the challenge isn't, um, has Jesus, can Jesus save you? He's already done it 2,000 years ago. The, cha the challenge is, do you believe it? Do you, believe, do you accept it? Do you, do you believe that God has done this through Jesus? Do you believe that he's um, finished all this kind of... Um, you know, wrath and all this kind of thing. You can be free from it all. You can um, be free from the slave market of sin. You'll still sin. You'll still trip up. But God's built repentance into that way. You can go and, and calibrate yourself back to God's standard, you know, because uh, with his help and everything. Uh, remember when I said that the wrath of God's upon you? Well, no, it isn't. 
and you know because for a believer the wrath's gone because the wrath was poured out on Jesus that's the whole point God chose to pour out everything on his own son at infinite cost so that we could say you know I'm free and so and God could look at us and go great uh, the unrighteousness um, there's a way of looking at this and we can look at the mechanics of this probably next week now how it all works but um, he declares us righteousness when we believe um, and then he uh, resurrects our spirit okay um, and we um, we become alive again we can become like alive and we can communicate with God and that's what praying is praying and discerning his ways and all that kind of thing so when you get an unbeliever and hearing a believer talk it's just, it's a foreign language because you can't have experienced all these four things having been turned around and then what you, what your life's like then because you haven't experienced it it's like it's like you know it's really hard to do that so what happens it needs an independent move of God to move upon an unbeliever to be able to speak light into their life but it first means that the unbeliever has to start to make moves towards and go do you know what I can actually take on board that the second Adam is where I really want to be I don't want to be an hashtag one, Adam hashtag one. I'll be born to this world, and it's and to be honest, you know, if I'm talking about my story. Being in Adam hashtag one is painful, damaging, and it just leads to cul-de-sacs which are just murky, dark, and horrible. It's not a fun life. There are times when you go, yeah, I'm full, you. Yeah, I've had a few drinks, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, brilliant for four hours. Then you wake up, ooh, my head. You know, then then replay it all again next week. That doesn't mean Christians don't drink, but I mean all that kind of escaping from your problem. You know, hashtag one, Adam hashtag one is is a is a is a murky existence. It's not great at all. It doesn't reward you. It doesn't make you feel you know like you're living the life that you could live. And um, but when you go into Adam hashtag two, when you become a believer and God places you in Christ, okay, that's when um, that's when you can um, really start to walk in purpose and we're going to look at some of that in uh, next week because as we read some of these phrases here unless we know what Paul's getting at when he wrote this it's all just words and you can just it just skims over your thinking but if we can open the engine room and look at what actually happened and we can start to see the um, the wonderful thing that God's done and um, and know that it's not just a bunch of religious people who say believe something quickly just move your mind into believing because then you're kind of in this weird place of believing the unbelievable and all that kind of thing but when you take it apart and you see how it works then you can go oh, just a minute I'm not just believing blindly in something I'm believing in a work of complete and utter genius that was handed to mankind by God and you look at the mechanics of it all okay so God wants everybody out of Adam hashtag one into Adam hashtag two, the final Adam, which is Jesus. Okay, and the way you get out of Adam one to Adam two is how faith. Faith. Be just believe it. Okay, I say just believe. You know, it's believe actually, it. It's believing in the fact that Christ died for your sins and mm. was punished for you, and that. Why? And you're implicated in this. Yeah. Not that this was happened to some guys down the street, or some, you know, people who like wearing frocks or something. I don't know, and or some religious sect or something like that. But it's actually personal for every person who's born into Adam one. So you must be included, because you're implicated in Adam one. Definitely implicated in Adam one. But God intends you to be in Adam two. Now I said to you before that everybody who's ever been born, um, Jesus is. Uh, death on the cross buys them out of the slave market of sin buys you back okay everybody has that provision made for them but only when you and, and you know so we're going to get into this in weeks but when Jesus died on the cross and the, the wrath was inflicted upon Jesus he was made the sin of the world right and you were in Jesus when that happened okay so basically when the wrath was poured out on him and he literally took the wrath you also took the wrath and God made it that you were taking it by proxy get it okay so that's what was happening now you didn't ha you were not crucified on the cross you weren't you know all the kind of have you seen the passion of the Christ it's pretty gruesome yeah and um, 
that didn't happen to you literally but vicariously it did happen to you and that's the provision made for you but if you turn that away and if you say thanks for that doing that for me but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave that over there and just live my sinful life uncaring about that then that's why, why God you know that's that's the thing what you are ultimately separated for God for not through sin sin has been paid for but you're ultimately separated from God because you didn't take the answer you rejected Jesus Christ and the finished work of God so God's done this amazing thing at infinite cost to himself okay and he's offering you a hand into your life and he's saying take the hand take the rescue plan take it now because what's going to happen is the door might close and right? I say to people where I work that it's like everybody's on a bus and on that bus it says the lake of fire and everybody's on that bus because you're in the first Adam and what gets you on that bus is because you're in Adam Adam hashtag one so the bus is going down the road the bus stops the doors open and Jesus is there going get off the bus just get off the bus come on and um, people and people sit there like you know, yeah, they're there, smoking another cigarette. It doesn't, I'm not having a go at smokers. I'm just saying, just the revelry of doing what I want to do, you know. And it's my life. I'm in control. I'm the judge. So that I think I'm yeah, and it's like I'm not going to take that. And then the, the bus might open the doors 25 times through your life, and you might have an opportunity to get. To, well, it might open once. That's scary, isn't it? Mm. That, you know, because God's not there going, oh, I think I'll give you 400 chances to get saved or, and become a Christian. No, you get one chance, maybe if you get one chance. Right? And everyone usually gets one chance to, to see light, you know. But um, that act of the doors, it's only an illustration, it's not really a bus. But all mankind is hurtling towards a common destiny. And God's desperate, so much so that he'll have nails rammed through his son's arms and feet and th thorns thrust upon his head. And just the terrible torture that he went through of being kicked out of the Trinity because he became the sin of the world. And we'll, we're going to unpack this in weeks to come. He actually became the sin of the world. God took all the sins of all mankind and put them on Jesus. And then because that happened, remember what we said? If you're, if you're unrighteous, if you're um, become, you know, wrath is coming upon you, if you've got a dead spirit, if you're in the slave market of sin, but if you become sin itself, then God would do his face from his son. And, God, and that was like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus said on the cross. My God, the Father, my God, the Holy Spirit, why have you, because it's three, you know, the Trinity, why have you forsaken me? And that was three hours, couldn't see your hand in front of your face. The, the area or the world went pitch black. And there wasn't, um, there wasn't an eclipse because it was Passover. It's the opposite phase. So, and that's what, that's what happened. And then after three hours, Jesus said, um, it is finished or basically the books are balanced and um, in other words he had atoned he, he paid for your sin now you can't do that and you can't even know about everybody's sin who will ever live throughout all mankind all billions and billions of people committing billions and billions of uh, sins unless you're God and you know infinitely everything so Jesus had to be God and to qualify to, to pay for our cost had to be fully man and that's why Jesus was incarnate. He came the God-man, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And so we're trying to hit a few nails on the head tonight. Generally, this isn't even the engine room. We haven't even gone into the, the, the kind of like, we haven't even gone through the door of the engine room yet about what this is, is about, but we'll do that. But first of all, I'm going to start with one of them. How did he save us from the slave market of sin? And um, I'm sorry for people who've heard this before. But it's, it's good teaching to <coughs> get into it. So, what you've got in your Bible is a word called um, redemption. And that's the buying out from um, the slave market of sin. And um, because he became sin on the cross, um, he was able to um, buy you out from the slave market of sin. So, another illustration where if there's like all these slaves, okay... And they're all, this is mankind all in the slave market of sin. Jesus goes up and says, I've bought and buying you out of the slave market of sin. Now, that's everybody who's able to be bought out of the slave market of sin. But as I've said before, it's only the ones who say, I'm up for that. You know what I mean? You bought me out. I'm coming. I'm going to follow you. So when, when the ownership exchanges hands, that's, the, that's when you have been redeemed, ransomed. Okay? You've been bought out. But then you've been ransomed 
when you say yes and only then are you really truly saved okay so there's two words can anyone remember what the first one is when you get bought out from <laughs> ex agorazo so you got um, um, ex which is out from an agora you have an agora when you've been on your holidays and you go to the marketplace um, and it, what no, no cause you I don't think you spent much time have you ever been to that the agora no, I, uh, no, I've heard yeah yeah so so it's like a marketplace so ex agorazo is, is been bought out of the marketplace and um, we're going to look at a few scriptures there so but what happens in the Bible is that you get this one word redemption which is put in place of that word exagorazo the buying out from and that word includes all mankind but only when it says lutrosis which is the other word which it means ransomed okay you've been ransomed and that, that means that you've been really really um, bought out but the Bible puts redemption for both of them words so it gets a bit confusing. Yeah, so yeah. ex Exagorazo. Yes, is when you've been bought by God mm. as a slave. Um, uh, Lutron. Lutrosis. Lutron. Lutron's good, it's just an N word. Yes. Is when you've been bought out, but you accepted that walk of Jesus. Yeah, so you've been set free. So, so Jesus walks up to you. We have the bus illustration, but it's the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah. And Jesus comes up to you and said, Guess what, um, Blake? I bought you already from the slave market of sin by paying with my life. Okay? It's an exchange. I paid with my life. Sorry. And um, and I've paid for your life. But you might... What? <laughs> Am I being a bit animated? Right. I paid for your... Jesus says, I paid for your life with my life. To buy you out of the slave market of sin, by which you are in. Who, who's the owner of the slave market of sin? Satan. Satan. Mm. Okay, because what happens is we all. Um, it says whatever. Um, <coughs> whatever you obey becomes your master. Whatever you obey becomes your master. Okay, so what they did, they obeyed the serpent, which was um, Satan, and then um, so therefore we've got a problem because God, who created man and man, kind, okay, he's now got this prime minister over them legally called Satan, okay. So they're legally belonging to the, you know, and, and Jesus was very clear in John chapter 8 to the Pharisees when they were ribbing him about his father. You know, who's your father born of a virgin? You know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, what happened there? You know, and he says, well, your father's Satan. It's like, <laughs> so say that again. Yeah, your father's Satan. It's true. Is you, if you're in Adam 1, the one, who, who does Adam belong to? Adam 1. Satan. Yeah. So you're in Satan. You're in, he's your father. So what God's trying to say is, I created you. I want to have to adopt you. I want to bring you into my fatherhood. I want to bless you and I want to lavish my love upon you. Okay, but you won't believe. You won't believe my rescue plan. You know. You can kind of bring like the um, Stockholm syndrome analogy into there as well, where it's like you've been you've been kidnapped um, and and you're kind of in the possession of somebody who's asking for a lot of money for you, and then somebody comes and pays that. And says, all right, you know, I've paid, I've paid for this now. I want, I want my mm. son back. I want my child back. Um, but then you've got Stockholm syndrome and molested because mm. it's just too comfortable being kidnapped. You know? Yeah. Mm. So, exactly right. So you get used to the fact that you're in like the possession of the kidnapper, and it's just like, well, I'll just try and live my days out like this. Oh, don't do that. You're in danger. You're on the bus. You're in the slave market of sin. But Jesus comes along and he says, I bought you. So we'll use Blake again as an example. Because he's a bit of a sinner, you know. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and we'll just say, you know, I bought you, Blake. And, um, and when, when you come across preachers and when you come across churches, some of it, you get blinded by the religion of it all or the, the, um, the theatre that's involved or the thing, you know, all that kind of thing. And it can be distracting. Because all the people are trying to say, by and large, through all the complexities of it all, is... Get in Adam 2. Get in Adam hashtag 2. I'm begging you to get into Adam hashtag 2. Because that's where you'll be able to be privy to the love of God and he'll lavish that upon you. Um, but it's the people who um, have been bought out from the slave market of uh, sin and won't let themselves be ransomed. And that's the frustration for many people and the frustration of God's heart to say... And the, we've used the silver to you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
he wants wants to look after us. He wants to, you know, help us live well and all that sort of stuff. But we we keep sort of saying, no. I'd rather sin. We're quite Mm. quite okay, thanks. We'll just continue for the way we are. Yeah. Yeah, so... Arrogant child. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the continuation is that after Jesus said, like, I've taken, I've, I've, I've paid for you, now, I, my decision is, okay, I'm going to follow you, and that's Lutron. Yeah, that's Lutrosis, yeah, Lutron. You you, um, you are then ransomed. So, um, in a lot of ways, you know, in, on receipt of this information that Jesus has paid for your life already, there's nothing else you can do about it, he's just done it. And um, if you don't take that offer, and you don't get ransomed, then, you, you know, God can say to you legally and rightfully, I actually freed you. I actually finished the, the job. I actually set you free, but you wouldn't believe my answer. You wouldn't. You wouldn't even accept that. You wouldn't take that on board because you love your sin too much. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so now I have to try you as a sinner. Well, yeah. And, and and the thing is, it's you rejected my plan, and my plan is Jesus. My plan is that work. What you know, that buying back by giving His life um, has been forwarded to you. But if you don't want to take that plan, then you know, you've got to start ducking. You know what I mean? As yeah. my dad used to say when he was punishing me, you better start ducking. You know, ducking like that. <laughs> I'm like, thanks for the love that you showed me there, Dad. It's awesome. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, so, and that, look, that ex Thank you, everybody. And uh, Lutrosis, they're the same word in English. Yeah, so... And what people, and, and what what the problem is as well with this whole thing is that you read redemption and it's almost like people are still. We, I'm trying to break it down so that um, we we who are believers um, understand the workings of what's going on. And I'll tell you why this is particularly um, useful for us is because when the enemy comes along and he does, and he tells us all these lies about our sin. And all that kind of stuff. You can have it in your armory. You know, the thing that you're going to stand solid on. Wait a minute. I was bought out from the slave market of sin. Yeah. And the devil will say, yeah, but you've still sinned. And then you can turn around and say, yeah, but I've been I've been um, ransomed. And I'm be- I belong to you. And then we start getting to the other things that we're going to talk about. Which is um, the identity um, of who we are. Um, how... You know, we can have commu- peaceful communion with God, and how we can walk as a new creation. And these are all going to be light and life over the next couple of weeks, because um, this is the engine room of salvation. Romans five and six, and then we get into seven, um, and then when we get into eight, then it's party time because we start talking about the glorification start part of what we're doing, what's to come. Um, so the first bit is we can't stop sinning, we're lawbreakers, we're in the slave market of sin. But he redeemed us, okay? He bought and ransomed us, okay? And we are redeemed, and we walk free from sin. Now, that we walk free from sin is idealistic in a sense. We can and we have the potential to walk free from sin, but we find ourselves still being lured back into these things that are... um, yeah, he's forgiven our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins are all paid for on the cross. Okay, so does that mean yippee, we can all go and sin? Well, if that's your if that's your motivation, then you probably don't really care about what God thinks. You know what I mean? Because God, as a father, is, is given an infinite cost and expense his son, and um, our reaction to that should be kind of like, wow. Well, what do I do then? How am I implicated in that? Well, he's paid for you. And he's redeemed you. And what's the what's the the question on your lips must be? I either reject that gift that God's done, I either accept that gift that God's done, or I just fill this void in between with other things and just pretend it's never happened. Because <laughs> this information has got to bring a response. It's got to, you know, it's. Go- you either accept that and want to walk well and want yeah. to do the right thing and follow follow him, yeah. or you don't. Yeah, and that's the process of becoming a Christian and becoming one of God's children, is do I want that to be true of me? Do I want him to have paid for my um, uh, sins? Do I want to have been freed from the slave market of sin?
And if the answer to that is no, then it's rejecting Jesus because you because God doesn't want you to be. Can you say well, they're both impinging each other? He doesn't want you to be a lawbreaker that incurs wrath, that makes you unrighteous, that you know your dead spirit can't communicate with God. So it's all they all knock on to each other. Yeah, well, 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 that's chapter seven in a few weeks. We're going to look at that. But uh, if you just look, if you just look at six fifteen, six fifteen, Romans six fifteen. What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. And this is the bit. Do you not know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one that you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? Right. So what's that that obedience thing? And if you go to um, 1 Corinthians 6. One Corinthians six nineteen. I'm just going to read it. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. And that's agzagorazo. That's the general everybody and message to everybody. You were bought at a price. Right, for anyone who's got a pen, right, this is just like, we're not going to go on much longer because we could do this. The full study on this would involve the word exagorazo, and that, when you've got redemption in your Bible, is these scriptures, okay? So this is exagorazo, a general buying out of all mankind. 2 Peter 2.1. 2 Peter 2.1. 2 Peter 2.1. One Corinthians six twenty. One Corinthians seven twenty three. These are all exagorazo. Galatians three thirteen. Galatians four five. Galatians five sixteen. And Colossians 4 5. That's exagorazo, the buying out of the slave market of sin for all mankind. Colossians. 4 5. Colossians 4 5. Now, lutrosis, there's also um, lutrosis, 1 Peter 1 18. Romans 8.23 So when you're reading Lutrosis it means not that everybody's genuinely but genu generally been bought by the by the you know the love of Je uh, the blood of Jesus but this is when the people who have been bought and have responded and been ransomed 1 Peter 1.18 Romans 8.23 Colossians 1.13 113 1 Timothy 2 6 to 7 Luke 1 68 Luke 2 38 Is all lutrosis. This is the saved, the actual redeemed. Hebrews 9 12 to 15. 
I'm not saying all of them are exhaustive, but I'm just saying the major things to look at there. Hebrews 9, 12, to 12 and 15. You can read 12 to 15, but 12 and 15. I've got a little figure there, and with all this slave market of sin, and Jesus stood in front of you, he says, I'll buy the lot. You know, that's his heart, that's Jesus' desire, that he buys the he, he's bought the lot, but everybody responds. And why wouldn't you respond? Why wouldn't you respond if you found that there's been a 2,000 year old book? And they put this pulling even more stuff out of the ground now that says this is true, you know, the, the Bible story is true, even the David and um, Hezekiah and Isaiah, all that stuff is all being verified and things like that. Why wouldn't you want to be freed from the slave market of sin? Why wouldn't you want to get in touch with your creator? Why wouldn't you want to live? A life where he's he's pursuing you and chasing you down with mercy and love to to graciously pour and lavish his love into you and it, and, and and as you do that as you believe then the other side of the coin is that he adopts you as a child okay and he treats you like a, ch a child and he becomes a father to you and he starts to do all this stuff which is um which you know I'm not going to tell you that it's tiptoeing through the tulips I'm not I'm not going to lie to you you know there are some challenges in being a Christian. Oh my goodness, there is, right? But um, but within that, the background um, that's running isn't, you know, uh, condemnation and these condemnation en engines and conviction engines and all that kind of thing. But it's actually love, joy, peace, manifesting as goodness, kindness and mercy, which have anchors of patience, faithfulness and self-control. All right, so all them things are kind of trying to, you know, he's trying to grow them things in all our lives. And do we fail? Of course we do. But we've got a father who knows that we're just children. And what do children do when they try and walk? Fall over. Okay? And even if you get to be a good walker, you're going to trip over something at some point. Right? So he knows that. So he's built, he's built recalibration or repentance into the whole thing so that we can constantly um, do the things that he's really done. You know, he's, he's wanted to do that. We've not talked about everything that he's done, but the finished work means... That we're freed from the slave market of sin, okay? And um, we're going to find out next week um, what else he's done. We'll probably do one or two of them things next week, but um, it's going to make this make more sense. Now, now you know, now you know that um, Adam hashtag one was a, a, a figurehead of all mankind, and Adam hashtag two. Is, is in the same way in God's thinking a figurehead of those who want to become Christians who want to be rescued by God's gracious hand let's read this again Romans 5 12 onwards therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in this way death came to all men you remember what we said he's a representation of all okay because all sin for before the law was given sin was in the world but sin was not taken into account where there is no law nevertheless death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command so he's basically saying sins there even if the command isn't and people are dying yeah? uh, breaking the command as did Adam who was the pattern of the one to come so he's saying that just as this is Adam 1 Adam 2 will have the same principles that if you're in that, that it, all of his life represents that. 15. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if many died, remember your dead spirit, by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So you've got Adam 1, that's one thing, but Adam 2 is much more of a thing, because it's, um, it's a much more powerful thing. 16. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin. Remember the judgment? The wrath of God is on mankind. Uh, followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. All right. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision, this is Adam 2, of grace, and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Can you say what it's juxtapositioning one man by the other man? The Adam, hashtag one, Jesus Christ, hashtag two. Consequently, 
Just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification. Remember what we talked about? It? Unrighteousness for righteousness? There we go, it's right there. It was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so th also through the obedience of one man many will be made righteous. righteous. Okay, so that's that's Paul saying it the law was added so that the trespass might increase but where sin increased grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so just to wrap this up tonight the ultimate the the thing that's happening there um, sin reigned in death but grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're in first Adam, one second, if you're in first Adam, you're going to re sin, 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 death, and that means the second death, which means the lake of fire. But if you put your trust in Jesus and you're you know, brought into the second Adam through the grace of God, then you are guaranteed eternal life. The pattern of one, eternal death. The pattern of two, eternal life. What are you going to pick? Um, I just like the translation that Mark says Clearly, through one person's disobedience, humanity became sinful. And through one person's obedience, humanity will receive God's approval. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the way you receive God's approval is by taking the rescue plan, which is Jesus and his finished work. And, um, Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, I'm thinking around, was it halfway through 15? It says, for if the many die by trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by, sorry, by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Yep. It seems to, to me that it's saying something that doesn't make sense, so I obviously don't understand it, because we know that the number of sinners in this world are huge and mm. numbers of devoted Christians in comparison to the population of the world is very few. I don't think you're talking about who's accepted that gift of uh, salvation but that is offered to anyone. Yes. But it says uh, the gift that came by the grace of one man um, I'm halfway through 15, okay. um, and it's, it says, for the many, if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? All right. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I, I guess from the, the sense, how I understand that, you know, Adam's sin, and of course, all of us. Um, inherited it. Yeah. Um, whereas Jesus came to give the gift to everyone, but not simply in the inherited it was um, yeah, the table it, was, it was almost like a gift that was mm. in abundance the overflowing, like he wanted to come and give it to you. Also, yeah, absolutely. You just got it. Absolutely spot on. Yeah. It was undeserved as well. Yeah. Or we don't deserve it. Yes, I know that's the important point. I think, I think that's why I think that's what the crux of Christianity is about. It's about, it's about that very much love. That we didn't earn anything. I don't, I'm, I'm not a Christian because I'm a good person, because I'm definitely not. Mm. Um, and all of us are not. But um, it's just the acceptance of, of that act. Yeah. So, so it's almost like formulaic. You're in Adam because you're in Adam. It's like because the wages of sin is death. That's another word scripture where it says. So if you're in Adam, so it's almost like as a consequence of Adam, you've got this thing on you. But God's grace isn't like that. This is what you're saying, isn't it? It's like because he's a, an independent act of his own will, he's forwarded this gift to you. So it's almost like he doesn't have to do it, but he does do that. So watch this. Just in um, in verse 9, 5, 9. Um, since we have been justified by his word, how much more? I'll just leave that. And then verse 10. For if when we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? And then going down to um, going down to 15, but the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more? <laughs> then further down um, 16 it says, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many transgressors. Right. And then later 17, 
For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more? So the overarching theme here is, yeah, you're in this kind of situation where, you know, you, you are, as a consequence of Adam, hashtag one, you are sort of like condemned, really. You know, it's all going to go wrong for you because God's, you're not finding the favour of God at all. But as we're finding, you know, as an independent, willful, with a smile on his face, with all wisdom and knowledge, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, he, he, he offers this to you and is offering there's like a present and continuous this is an offer that's offered to you and that's got to it's much more than just a, a, a logical consequence of something a formulaic circumstance but it's an actual act of God's will to actually presently and um, I'm trying to think of the the um, the, uh, the word for an active present it's like an aorist tense um, he's doing it but he's continuing to do it and he will continue to do it it's like a this this is the gift that never stops giving do you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's that's why it's much more because it's not like the truth. It says it there. It's not like the first thing. And when you read it, it sounds like it is because it talks about many died because of the first thing, and many lived because of the. Well, it sounds like it's the same, but it's not. It's like you're saying, Brett. It's the intention behind it of a loving God who's that's it dynamically and kinetically offering it to you now. So that's why it's much more. And um, it's it's living. It's living. It's bright. It's light. It's hope. So the sin is something that happened in the past, and the saving is mm. something that happens all the time. Yeah, and it, and it, and it's 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 yeah. a it's a like like how much does one man mess up and now you're all messing up, but God's trying to fix something. So imagine when God purposely trying to fix something opposed to just a single man trying to do something. Yeah. It's like a yeah. But because of this, this has gone from justification, the fact that. Um, you um, have been saved if you're a Christian the cross has made it that you're on a solid rock of ground which is Jesus but now it's talking about sanctification and this it's mixed messages a little bit and it's going to say how much more is your life affected by this whole thing that God's doing so in other words when you, you you're just in a consequence when you're in Adam 1 and you're a victim of that consequence but God has a dynamic life for you to live how much more is it that you get into this Adam too, you know, by faith? So um, now, um, just to tell you about how this teaching is going to go down for a while, um, there's four separate um, elements to it. We've talked tonight about the problem, and we've started on the process. Okay, we're going to go on to the position that that leaves us in, and then we're going to go on to the practice. How that in 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 um, it involves our walk. How do we walk because of these truths? Okay, so um, we did. Yeah, it's the problem, which we talked about. The um, we can't stop sinning. We can't survive in His presence. We can't even stand in His presence, and we can't even speak to Him. So we're in trouble. Um, and that's the problem. Yeah, and you know, the process. And we did this one tonight. Um, we didn't. We didn't pay it. The, the attention that we could because it needs probably about an hour just on this but this in a sense is the is the factual part his life you know he's, you've been bought at a price you've been redeemed and that's one of the processes and there's three more processes because we have to answer how do we avert the rightful wrath what actually happened okay and we have to ask the question how does the unrighteous become righteous and if you were listening earlier you just find out that that's a pr pronunciation from God based upon your faith. And then you, how does your dead spirit come alive again? We're just going to... And that's as a consequence of the other, the other three. But um, that's the process. And then the position, which wouldn't take long to talk because it's just telling us where it leaves us, where that finished work leaves us. And the, the practice is it leaves us like that, but how do we walk because of that? And them two will probably be one... one so when we walk away from Romans, my heart is that we've got a, a, a notes to go back to, which covers a working knowledge of the engine room of salvation. Okay, um, and then when we get to glorification, which is the bit, which is straight out of light, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I did want to say something else tonight, just to finish, is that um, I was praying this week. Yeah, it is. And then um, what it was. I was talking about, do, I, do we have to go over the justification, sanctification, glorification thing? Or do we, do we generally think that that's readily in our memory? That there's three tenses of salvation, 
justified, he's paid for your sins. Right, it's justified, never did it. Okay. But sanctification is his work in us now as we're trying to walk it out as Christians, and glorification is when we um God you know, Jesus comes back and does all that kind of thing. But sanctification is split into two. One of them is my sinful self, and one of them is walking in the new nature, and that battle that goes on every single day. And the Lord just slipped this to me and said, you know, you'll get into struggles because basically there's four separate things to, to, to look at. There's the, the justification, which is about the cross. There's the glorification, which is about the wonderful future for Christians. But you've got your sanctification, which has got two elements to it, the sinful self and the saved self. Now, most people dive into the sinful self and only look at that. But God said to me, and sure, because I'm sinful, I do that. I, I kind of like only look at that because it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a working knowledge of the scriptures, but the truths of these need to really drop and settle, like in all of us, into our spirits. Why, why are you looking at a quarter of the whole work, finished work, when you could be looking at the justification? There's loads of material to get your head into there, and you could be looking at glorification. That's a three hours of prayer in the morning if you want to talk about that, and then you're looking at your saved self. But we tend to go into that one quarter and go, human nature, yeah, you know, but human sin's been paid for. Your past, present and future sins have been paid for. Mm -hmm. And God goes, yeah, I know your sin, but get your eyes up, get your eyes fixed on Jesus. Look at Jesus. He's risen, he's glorified. And you've, you know, I want you to take sin seriously, but I don't want you to wrap yourself up in a, you know, like a noose or tie yourself up because of all the sin that you've got. Just stop, you know, and then getting your eyes on Jesus, looking at the cross, looking at the future will, will bring that joy and the rise within you to say, hey, you know what, there's a lot of good going on in this Christian thing. This isn't just left us uh, flapping around like a wind on the back of a trailer or something, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know what I was, um, you know, like <laughs> cut adrift is I'm trying to say, <laughs> cut adrift and unanchored. You know what I mean? It's not left us like that. We've got things we can think about during the day, things we can thank God for around the cross. We've got things that we can thank about the future that's coming. We've got things that we, we can thank and give thanks for in our lives. I think this started, whole thing started about giving thanks, didn't it, isn't it? And then, you know, I'm back to that again. God's saying, you know, be thankful, be joyful and walk well. Happy? Father, we do thank you because we're starting to scratch the surface a little bit about what you actually came to do, Lord God. And um, um, the engine room of your of your dealings with, us, with Jesus, Lord, and the finished work. It's a fascinating thing, Lord God, and I pray that we will not just be people who take on knowledge, but we will be people who realise that all this stuff happened by the hand of the Father. Lord, that you independently acted um, as a, a free will thought to actually save and offer salvation to us freely. So, Lord, help us to be wise, help us to walk well in this, and help us to take the free gift of salvation and the free gift of a sanctified life in Jesus' name. Amen.